Thanks, Claire. Um, I suppose if you think about what we're doing here in Ireland, every year we spend 7 billion euros on buying energy to bring into this country. And that is not financially viable, nor is it viable from an economic resource point of view as to the use of our fossil fuel resources that we're bringing into the country. So we have to change that. We have to do something about that. So I want to talk to you about maybe some options that we could approach or we could look at for changing that. I came from an agricultural background. I did agricultural science in UCD. And I saw that we had great opportunities to use biomass and convert that into bioenergy. So I went in to do postgrad work. I looked at how could we extract liquid biofuels and take these liquid biofuels and use them in, in diesel engines. Sounds like a great plan. Like great plans, it doesn't always go according to plan A or B. And I vividly remember the day I blew up the engine in the engineering building in UCD. <laughs> Um, the engine is in a test cell and I'm in a control room, I'm controlling it. The engine went bang. Engines aren't supposed to go bang. Um, so when I was surveying the bits of broken metal and oil on the ground, one of the thoughts that, that occurred to me was, how was I going to explain this to my supervisor? Because I'd only borrowed the engine uh, for a short period of time. But how and ever we got over that, and these things happen, and I suppose hopefully they don't happen too often, so we can get on with solving some of the problems. But if you think of that explosion, and we think of the explosion that we're having in the population growth at the moment, that's a very serious problem we're going to approach maybe 9 billion people by 2050. And that's going to have a lot of demands on our resources. For example, water. Only 3% of the water on the planet is drinkable, and 2% of that is in polar ice caps. So we'll have a shortage of that. What about food? We've seen the impacts from a lot of weather patterns now that have disrupted food production and caused shortages and difficulties associated with that. And of course, as societies grow and develop, there's a greater demand for energy. And if we look at how globally our societies have developed. They've developed around carbon, and we use carbon as our energy source for nearly everything that we do, for our heating, lighting, controlling, for pharmaceuticals, for plastics, for absolutely everything. And the more societies develop, the more demands we will have on that carbon, and the more pressure we'll be putting on our carbon society. So can we find ways of recovering that carbon, recycling it, or reusing it? And there are a lot of ways that we can do that, but we've got to think a little bit differently about it. If you look at in the plastic bottles, for example, that you have for, for water and so forth, we can recycle those and we're very good at doing that. But every time you recycle plastic, you degrade it a little bit, so you reduce the options that you have for dealing with it. But as you go through, and it's the same for textiles or paper or metal, and as you go down through the, the recycling process, you get to a stage where it's called, it's, you get to its end of life. And at that point in time, it usually goes for disposal, maybe to landfill, maybe to incineration. But what we've done actually with the company in Port Leash, uh, called Sinar, we've built the world's first plant where you take that end-of-life plastic and we convert that back into synthetic diesel or synthetic petrol. So it saves us extracting oil out of the ground and we can recycle that carbon. I suppose one of the difficulties with that is it's not virgin oil, it's not a biofuel, it's somewhere in between. It's a little bit of a grey area and the legislation hasn't caught up on that, but we're going to have to deal with that. We can also look at, as a developed society, how we use the energy more efficiently within our society. Are there better ways that we could use it? And there are plenty of ways that we can do that quite easily without impacting on our lifestyle or our lifestyle choices. An example again, we were, we were building a, a biomass pellet press to do some experiments on recovered paper and fibres and things like that. And we're having a lot of problems trying to get the, the pellet press to work. So we had to build our own controller to control the motors and augers and things like that. Um, and then one weekend, we were playing around with it and we kind of had burnt out two motors, we didn't want to burn out any more, so we connected to these high energy discharge lights. So we started playing around with those, we found we get really good performance out of the lights using the controller. We use these sort of lights in all of the streets in Ireland. So if we put a simple control box onto those lights, we could save in Ireland alone on street lights about 12 million euros every year, without the lights going off, without any impact on how we live as a society. So there are things we're doing, but again the legislation is making it difficult for, for us to roll out those sort of technologies. So we, again, these are barriers. We've got to try and get over and try and deal with them. We have an awful lot of energy and carbon invested in food and food production. If you go to any supermarket and you buy your food ingredients and your food uh, products and you walk out the front door, take a look at it the next time you do that. According to a number of surveys, both here in the UK, about 35% of everything in that bag that you carry out will be thrown away because either you've let it go out of date, you've changed your mind about it, or you bought too much in the first place, which is fine. That's what developed societies do. So in Ireland, we dispose of about 900,000 tonnes of organic waste every year, which is an awful lot of material currently going to landfill options. If we could stream that, if we could look at separating that, we could take wet waste into anaerobic digestion, dry waste into gasification technologies, both of which would produce a very nice biogas, that can go into the national grid system so we can still use gas in our heating, in our, in our cooking, in, in our systems, in generation of electricity without any changes. We're just changing where it's coming from. 
but we need to think about it a little bit differently. We were working with um, a food company that were producing pizzas. And um, whether you wear the pizzas, you know they're pre-packed, they're put into boxes and they're delivered out. The box is actually worth more than the pizza. So if the pizza is misshapen, you keep the box, you throw away the pizza, because the box is designed to fit into fridges, containers, packaging and so forth for transport. So they had a lot of misshapen pizzas, as is the nature of the job. So we said, okay, that's a very high energy source. It's, it's food fit for human consumption. Could we take it and build a little anaerobic digester? Um, and we figured out how we would do that. We could use the heat back in the plant for sterilization and processing, and we could sell electricity to the grid. It made perfect sense. So we decided to go about trying to build it and, and put it in place. To get over the planning, the legislation, the connection, the licensing laws to do it was taking us between five and seven years. And that killed the project dead. The same project on the continents took between 12 and 18 months to get it in place. So we're not very clever with how we're using legislation in this country. We've got to think about how we would do that a little bit differently. If you look at Denmark, they're the world's leader with regards to wind technology, yet they have only a fraction of the resources that we have here in Ireland. Why aren't we doing that? Spain is developing their wave resources. Again, they've only a fraction of the potential that we have. These are missed opportunities. They're out there, we should be taking them. We have a need for sustainable energy. Our society is not going to function without it. Why are we not doing more about it? A lot of it is about we've got to think a little bit more cleverly about how we use a legislation, how we put two things together, such as the opportunities that we have and the demands for them, whether the demands are in Ireland or whether the demands are in the continent to sell green electricity into the grid. I suppose one of the problems with that, problems with that is the attitude or the scenarios when you go and face a problem in this country. The first, I suppose, scenario or way of facing a problem is you do nothing with it and maybe it'll go away, which is not very good. Second one is the ostrich approach, where you stick your head in the sand and see if things look any better from down there. Generally, it doesn't improve things. The third option, which is what we're working is we try and get people to think a little bit more, maybe think a little bit bigger about the project, think a bit more collectively. It's, yes, it's you and me and society and it's all of us together. And collectively, we can have an influence to do something about it. So I think from Ireland, we hear a lot about our smart economy, but our smart green economy has phenomenal potential for Ireland and Ireland Inc. to generate income and to keep that income in the country rather than going abroad to buy uh, dollars or to buy uh, barrels of oil internationally and bring it back here. So what I would say is there's a phenomenal opportunity out there. We've just got to look beyond these roadblocks and these barriers that we have at the moment and maybe try and grab that opportunity and bring it back to Ireland. Thank you for your attention.